You're tuned into the Writing Community Chat Show, the live streaming YouTube podcast that brings you the stories of authors, screenwriters, and more. Indie or established, this show's for the community, and we invite you to be a part of it. Head to the Writing Community Chat Show.com for more info. The WCCS, together as one, we get it done. Hello and welcome to the Writing Community Chat Show. It's the weekend, everybody. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Writing Community Chat Show. That means it is Friday and we have made it to the weekend. And that could mean many different things to you, whether you've been working hard in work, doing your nine to five, or hectically working through the nights or whatever whatever your day job is. Um, or you could have been grafting hard writing your books or reading uh, leisurely or for work. So whatever your week has been like, let us know. Um, for me, it's been a case of work. It's been also very exciting because last week on the after show, uh, we were kind of given a task. Myself and Halo Scott, who was one of our previous guests, were challenged to write a book um, in a bit of a book off situation. So we both have a 30,000 word target to write a book each. Uh, mine is going to contain a mythical Welsh dragon and Halo's book is going to contain a quite demonic style unicorn. Very, very interesting. So that's our writing plans. I'm very excited about tonight's guest because he has indeed written uh, historical fiction and that is the journey I am now stepping into. And I'm finding that very, very exciting because Previously being a pantster, now stepping into the right, a world of historical fiction, I've been forced to go down the plotting route. And that for me is very unusual, but also it's been quite um, it's been quite exciting because I've, it's almost like, not like the story is already there, but you've got the characters, you've got the steps in history, and now you've got to weave in your own magic and your own kind of deceptions and all this great stuff. And I think historical fiction is very quickly becoming a, a, a big... Um, a big, what's the word I'm looking for? Something I'm really interesting, <laughs> interested in at the moment. Uh, so yeah, I hope you're having a great week. And if you're learning something new or writing something new, let us know all about that. Um, hello to Anya in the chat. So much fun. Last week's after show was indeed. You might notice I'm sat here on my own. And that is because Mr. Hooley is very busy with uh, family over the Easter uh, weekend. That is completely understandable. So I hope he's having a great time. And we will miss him, of course. Um, but he is not here today, so I am going to get my guest on sooner rather than later. But thank you for tuning in live. This is streaming onto um, YouTube, LinkedIn, and uh, Twitch, newly for us. And a, our guest tonight is linking it to his Facebook and Instagram as well. So if you're watching from there, thank you very much and welcome to the show. Um, you do get to ask your questions. So if you've got questions for our guest tonight, you can send them in. And there is a specific section for that at the end of the show as well. So stick around and see what random questions come up in the best kind of way. But please enjoy the chat. And if you're watching this back or listening back, thank you so much for doing it. Um, you know, it's great to have you guys commenting on YouTube as well. Hit that like button. Of course, that really helps. Uh, Anna says LinkedIn has streaming. It certainly does. Yeah. Um, we get a lot of... Uh, communication and, and, and followers with business type people on LinkedIn, but not often people pick up the streaming, but I'm going to keep giving that a little push now and see if that actually does pick up. So it could be useful for you as well if you're building your author brand, which we talk about is quite often uh, important. So maybe LinkedIn live streaming could work for you guys. Uh, we'll let you know how that goes for, on our side. And if it is worth picking up, then we will certainly pass that message on. Uh, so I'm going to get tonight's guest on and we're going to have a great chat. We did have some technical hurdles to jump over to get us streaming to all the right destinations, but we are there. And uh, tonight's guest has got a great story and love, like I said, the historical fiction journey I'm currently on. So very excited to get into this chat. So ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome back to the show, obviously. But today's guest, uh, where am I? Uh, we are thrilled to have a special guest on AJ West tonight. Uh, he is an award-winning former BBC journalist and broadcaster turned captivating storyteller. From breaking news to crafting compelling narratives, AJ has enchanted audiences with the, his words across various platforms, including national newspapers, magazines and television programmes. His best-selling debut novel, 
the Spirit Engineer, won the Historical Writers Association debut Crown Award, uh, gaining international praise for its telling of a long forgotten true story. So join us as we delve into his journey from the newsroom to the world of fiction. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome AJ West. Hello, AJ. How are you doing? Hello. I'm really good, thank you. Although I should actually start by saying that as far as I'm aware, I haven't managed to make the technology work, so I don't know if I am on my Instagram. Am I? <laughs> because um, it's not giving me the option to go live. It's just not giving me the option. Oh, so, dear me. I don't know. So there we are. Uh, maybe, maybe not. It's got a tick next to it on, on my screen, so I think you might be. <laughs> well, who knows? We tried. <laughs> If you're watching from AJ's uh, LinkedIn, please, uh, sorry, uh, Instagram, let us know in the chat, please, because we're still kind of figuring, figuring this out. Uh, yeah, AJ, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on the show and chat to you. Where in the world are you coming from for our viewers to, to know? Uh, South London. <laughs> South London. Um, and is it as, as wet as it has been in Wales lately? No, never. It's um. It was it was uh. What was it? It was actually glorious today. It was really sunny. It was quite warm. I went for a nice long run, and um. But it's been absolutely drenchingly wet the last few days. So yeah, we're being teased by the summer at the moment. We're at that time of the year, aren't we? I know it's kind of popular, isn't it? Everyone is always going. Oh my god, it's so wet. It's so rainy. Like we are. We are in the British Isles, and it is April. So you know, it's kind of that's not unusual. It is wet. Yeah, definitely. Um, is there such a, a thing as a nice long run? Uh, is that real? No, you're quite right. There's no such thing. I was just trying to put. <clears throat> I was trying to put a positive spin on it. Um, <clears throat> no. Um, no. And also at the moment, um, you know, while we're doing this, we might as well share, right? Um, I have uh, an ear infection, so I can't wear my earbuds. So um, normally, I like going on of my runs listening to the Spice Girls and uh, Britney and all of my favorites, uh, but I couldn't even do that. So it was just me and my thoughts for an hour and a half. Yeah. It makes a and it's difference. amazing where your thoughts go. Like when you're going on a long run or you're on a long walk, if you like hiking or canoeing or whatever it is you do, you're not focused on your phone for an hour and a half. It's amazing where your thoughts go. And it's proof yeah. that we'd be so, we'd all be so much happier, I think, or I would anyway, if I wasn't constantly staring into my phone. Yeah, it, it certainly does make a big difference. And I use that as a writing tip before where people mention they got writer's block, perhaps, and getting out for a nice walk, leaving all that behind and, and getting that story working over in your head makes a huge difference to how that develops. And I think Oh my god, like yeah. half half of the half of my favorite lines and um passages in in my first book and now also in my second book came to me while I was running or walking or sitting on the bus. And I my my phone is filled with notes you know of course back in the olden days people used to get their feather and quill out and write on the right in the little <laughs> book didn't they but nowadays i'm there on my phone even that is on my phone but no it's filled with i've got um a notes file that's called um uh what do i call it special special ideas special ideas i like it yeah yeah i've got one that's like one that is like uh next book which started off as what's my next book going to be but now there's about literally i'm not joking there's about a hundred um book titles and ideas for stories that i could write that have popped into my head from listening to non-fiction because that's what i love to do you know when i relax it's non-fiction is kind of my fix historical non-fiction so yeah well i mentioned that um at the start of the show we've had a bit of a writing challenge on our after show last week and i am now stepping into the historical fiction world so i'm going to definitely pick some um so pick, take some tips and pick your brain on that li a little later on but before we do that and before we jump into the start of the the first part of the show what's london like for a writer uh is there a good writing scene and can you connect with people or do you do you do that well london's fantastic um much to the chagrin of uh lots of people outside London and I think understandably so you know the majority of the publishing houses are based in London the majority of book launches are in London it's seen as a bit eccentric if you have your book launch outside of London so you know while a lot of other industries my background was at the BBC a lot of in other industries are you know for better or worse actually spending a lot of money moving out of London and um, the publishing industry is doing that too, but it's still a very London cent London centric place. So I personally absolutely love London. I love the fact we have gay clubs nearby um, our, our house. We have, you know, pubs for normal people too. 
um, amazing facilities and, and beautiful parks. And I just find it incredible just the fact that I walk to the library and I'm walking literally under the Houses of Parliament and over Westminster Bridge. For me, that blows my mind every day as a kid from Milton Keynes yeah. who never expected I would get to live in London. So I'm kind of starstruck by the city every day. But it's also, um, we don't need to get political or anything, but it's also an increasingly dangerous and frightening city to live in. And um, I feel as though I'm closer to sacrificing my proximity to the publishing industry to leave and get away actually and find somewhere that's maybe quieter and that feels a bit safer. So um, I've got that quandary at the moment. Um, but for, for, from a writing perspective, it's, I mean, it's second to none. Yeah. Uh, Anya says that's um, that's awesome. Um, I, yeah, I agree. Even walking across Westminster Bridge and, you know, having Parliament around and that, that kind of architecture, it must be quite inspiring for someone who writes historical fiction because just seeing those sort of buildings must spark imagination, right? Oh, sure. To be surrounded by history um, and the, the kind of the eccentric foibles of history and the, the unexpected uh, stories that just um, they pop up at you all the time. I was walking along uh, Strand uh, the other day towards St Paul's and um, I ended up just noticing on this little brick wall was a little mouse um, carved into the brick. And, you know, a lot of places you'd see that and you'd have to go to a pub and ask someone very elderly to say, why is there a mouse on the brick? And they may or may <laughs> not know. But the thing about London is it's so thoroughly documented by mm. so many people that I could Google where I was, the building I was, and what was this mouse. And it came up and told me, and it turned out that the two guys who were on the scaffolding building that particular building 200 years ago had an argument over the man's bread and cheese, and one of them pushed the other one off and killed him. And wow. so as a mark of the guy who died, obviously with bread and cheese, they put a mouse on the brick. <laughs> now, That's incredible. Like, that that just blows my tiny little mind like that that alone i could write a short story a novella maybe even a full novel about that yeah. and that's just one instance on one day and you know the other thing is i was walking past the ref church which was totally shelled out it was just an empty husk after the second world war because they bombed it it was one of the sir christopher wren churches again leading up to st paul so this is only like within a quarter of a mile right um, and I, I thought, you know, I'm just going to go in and I'm going to talk to the church warden and ask them about the church. And I ended up getting this full tour and um, amongst many, many amazing things, it took me down to the crypt and the chains that used to be put across so the body snatchers couldn't snatch the coffins. And then she said, you hear that bell? Because it was chiming quarter to 12. She said, that is the same bell, the same exact bell that Shakespeare and Elizabeth I heard when they were called to church. Wow. And, and the character in my second novel the betrayal of thomas true first plug there will be many and um, <laughs> gabriel griffin in real life was called gabriel lawrence a very different character by the by i changed him a lot from my book but gabriel lawrence uh, attended that church in fact as far as i'm aware he married there he got married there to his wife who then died before he himself was arrested uh, under the sodomy act so he would have heard that exact bell and it's that that's the kind of thing that even since childhood, I've never been able to get a grip on. And that's why I write historical fiction, because it's a way of connecting with those things. That is awesome. Yeah, I love that story. And um, I'd love to get, you know, into those sort of areas and go and do that myself. And I think there's a great tip to take from that and taking the brave step to go into a place you're interested in and asking those questions. Because what came out of that clearly was talking about chains over, you know, learning about coffin stealers for a start or body snatches. You know, yeah. that opens up a whole world, a different story again then for you. So I think it's a really good tip there. Take that step and, and ask the question. Absolutely. I uh, When I was researching my first novel, <laughs> The Spirit Engineer, um, I, uh, I went over to Northern Ireland before I had any whiff of getting published, which we should talk about, by the way, because I don't want anyone thinking that I'm sitting here as like some wealthy author in some posh apartment in some beautiful part of London. It's a nice part of London, but we rent. The flat is the size of a shoebox. You can basically see the entire flat here. We make we make the best of a bad thing. But, um, you know, I am still an establishing author. I, I, I was a, a bestseller with my first book. I won an award with it. Uh, things are great. Things are going well. 
I got my royalty check today and, you know, I won't say how much it was, but let's just say it was it was considerably less than a month's rent for six months book sales. Right. So wow. I'm not I'm not living I'm not living the JK Rowling dream. Just put it that way. All right. So um, uh, I forget what I was going to say now. But what was I going to say? Tell me. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you said, well, before we get on to that publishing journey anyway, let me play the video. I oh, know I was going to say, sorry. I, I remembered. On. I was going to say, I went over to Northern Ireland to research yes. this book. Yeah. And I went to the, I found the rocks where William Jackson Crawford in real life, because I, I found his death certificate in the public records office, in Northern Ireland. It said where his body was found. I went to the exact point where his body was found. And I did some my investigative work. And I was like, well, why would he do it here? Because it's quite exposed. I walked up the hill. And there were these bungalows at the top of the hill and i knocked on the closest bungalow that overlooked the, the water where william had taken his life and opened the guy this very elderly man opened the door and it turned out he was the only person in the area who could remember that there used to be a kind of school for young women there who trained young women who had maybe got into a bit of trouble from working classes in that in this building this big imposing Victorian building and so that gave me a whole sense of what William would have seen in his last moments and why did he choose to be there what took him to that particular place is a mystery I've never been able to answer but the point I was going to make is uh, because I think I've got a journalistic background and I'm used to knocking on people's doors and asking questions if I hadn't have done that I'd never have met that guy and I would never have seen the photographs that have never been published that were in his own personal collection so just to reiterate if you're going to write historical fiction I do think you have to be quite brave and bold and un you know unapologetic about about asking questions yeah definitely that, that's uh it's really good and you know as as someone who's Oh, yeah, let me play the video because I'll, I'll, we go off on a tangent with historical fiction, but I want to talk about your career as well. So I'll play the first um, video, then we'll get into your road to writing because I'm really interested in that. So part one. <laughs> So AJ, uh, obviously we talked about your debut being a bestseller. Um, a lot of praise for that book and for for your upcoming novel this out in July. But where did that journey all start for you? What were the inspirations, or was there a, a person that was an inspiration for you? What kicked off your writing journey? So uh, I wrote since I was a kid. I wrote at university. I always wanted to be a, a published author. Um, I was working at the BBC as a television newsreader. Um, I ended up uh, getting sacked um, and just at the point where I was sacked by the BBC, I um, was reading Harry Houdini's memoir, having watched uh, a brilliant series about the life of Harry Houdini on, on HBO. And so I'd ordered off um, the website that shall not be named, uh, kind of publish on order book, which was his, his memoir, A Magician Among the Spirits. I was on about page 256, I think, if I'm right. And he mentions just totally in passing oh by the way i met this guy uh, william jackson crawford northern irish he'd come over and showed me his pictures of spirits and he's completely mad and then, then two pages later oh by the way that guy william he killed himself what a shame on we go you know it was very arrogant of houdini i mean you know i guess there are some people in this world you think actually have justified arrogance and i think houdini possibly is one of them and um, maybe arthur conan doyle is another fascinating interplay between those two and i just i saw this guy's name and I was just fascinated by it. And I had to find out more. And I think, you know, when I was going through this maelstrom in my life after leaving the BBC and um, everything that happened after I ended up on Big Brother and I ended up doing various crazy things afterwards, um, this was the thing that kept me focused and reminded me actually what matters to me in life. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a very interesting journey for a lot of people to look at that and first of all working in broadcasting in itself i mean writing for for journalism is obviously very different to writing novels i mean did you struggle with any kind of transition through that or were you quite natural into writing your uh, historical fiction after writing um, journalism well let's i mean let's start with the similarities first because actually there's no surprise that journalists become authors um mm. charles dickens as an obvious example thomas hardy you know other people i think thomas hardy did he write i think he wrote for some journals anyway um it's no surprise because you are having to start with the most interesting thing, fill out with some detail and end with a bang. 
that's you know if you're a tv news reporter or a radio reporter and you've got 60 seconds to tell a story of i don't know sometimes sometimes some really grim stories about car crashes or a murder for instance but you start with um you know a 24 year old man has been found dead in such and such a place uh with you know uh, injuries to his throat for instance right Th those are the most i hate to say it but we're not we're talking about a hypothetical person here yeah. those are the most exciting details and then you fill out well where was where was the park where he was found and what are the police saying and what time was it and was it a dog walker and you know what are his what has, has has his family given a statement and then at the end you have what's called a payoff right so you have some sort of whether it's wordplay or whether it's you know one final detail or whether you're hankering uh, harking back to the start the point is you learn as a journalist how to grow it, grip interest and then hold it and then give a satisfying ending euphemism not intended so <laughs> um, so so that's a similarity um i think uh your the, the tightness of your writing um again like i was talking to someone the other day who's um a journalist and, uh, and an author and we were both saying that you know, one of the things we find hardest when we're editing our own books is word repetition, because it's really drummed into you as a journalist, and quite rightly so, that you don't write the sentence, a man walked in and saw a man on a chair, he walked up and sat down on a chair, he pulled his chair back and looked at the man, right? Mm -hmm. And yet I see prose like that, I'm going to be a bitch now and I don't care, I see prose like that all the time in novels, uh, Dan Brown. You can't, you can't keep <laughs> describing I mean, I, I wish, I wish I was successful as Dan Brown. I think he can take it, right? But um, the repetition of words and clumsy sentence structure and things is something that's kind of, at least it used to be, frankly, reading BBC News online now, I don't think it is, but you, you used to be really beaten into you to, to write in quite a fluid way and really care about the words that you're using. The difference, of course, is that it's long form. To write 100,000 words is very different from writing a 60-second script. And so that was tough. Yeah, of course. Um, no, you, you mentioned some good points there, and I, I personally use uh, Pro Writing Aid. I know there's a tool on there to check repeated or, or commonly used words. So I'm I'm not sure how, you know, especially someone like Dan Brown who uses, you know, multiple editors. I assume that that if that is a bugbear of many people, that wouldn't be picked up. You know, it's quite surprising, but it is it is kind of what it is. So yeah, um, well. I don't know whether he does actually. One of the things I found, I'm, I'm fortunate enough, and I'm going to drop a name here as kind of loud as a flat iron, um, <laughs> but I've been very lucky to have become friends or friendly with Patricia Cornwell, the legendary, like she basically invented CSI crime drama, um, who sold hundreds of millions of books. You know, um, she has, you know, she has the dream author career, right? Yeah. Um, you know, but she's still living the author life in the way that is not unrecognizable to any of us on this you know she she sits on her own in front of a computer and writes a story then sends it to an editor an editor comes back probably in her case quite nervously because she's formidable and says i'm not sure this works and she makes the changes and it goes to print she doesn't have like a team of 50 people making sure her book is as polished as it can possibly possibly be in fact i was talking to another author uh, at a festival not that long ago he was saying that even though she sold like millions and millions, this is like a big name author whose books have been made into films and all sorts. She wanted to call her book one thing and they wouldn't let her. They forced her to change the name of her own book because they just didn't like the title and they didn't think Sainsbury's or Tesco's would want it. You know, it's an example of the fact. And, and, and even even these massive authors are saying to me, there's no promotion for my book. Mm. There's no marketing. I've, you know, luckily these people happen to be, you know, well enough off to think, well, do you know, what? I'm just going to, I'm going to pop 20 grand in and I'm going to do my own marketing. Yeah. But you'd be amazed that even when you're at the top of the top of the top, you're still as an author, uh, you know, having to scrap and scrape a little bit. Yeah. Do you think that's, it could be like a tactic by the publishing houses to think that this author has a big author platform? So we're going to put less money into that person because their books will naturally sell and we'll put more money into, say, a smaller author or author profile. Would that make sense or would that be a thing? Do you know? <laughs> 
you will you think it might make sense but it doesn't happen no i mean generally it's very difficult doing these interviews without mentioning names because i don't want to bitch but <laughs> you know there are there are some very famous authors who aren't perhaps maybe their main interest isn't being an author but they have written a book who even though they have millions of followers and even though they are national television personalities and household names will have wild amounts of money spent promoting their books and they're not really particularly expected to promote their own books on their own platforms it falls to the publisher conversely for the small author who has maybe a hundred followers on Instagram and doesn't really know how it works, they're told by the marketing in their publisher, well, you really should be doing more on TikTok and Instagram and, and Twitter. It's 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 madness. Yeah. It's madness. And and it's and to be fair, to, you know, it's I think from the publisher's point of view, if you've got a very famous, powerful author, they will have had to have paid a very famous, powerful amount of money to get their book. And so of course. The big bosses are looking saying you'd better sell a lot of copies of that book yeah. so you know that's why but from you know from mere mortals um such as ourselves you do look on and think if you did that with my book i'd be an international number one bestseller and my life would be made you know and and that's tough yeah it is um it's very interesting and 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 you said on the chat is quite depressing to hear that you know even those at the top have to work as hard as we do almost that you know getting that book out there i mean marketing for pretty much everyone that goes through that process of releasing their first book hits us in the face like a shovel um because we suddenly realize we've got to figure out how to sell those books and it is tricky but you know it's part of the process now um before we get on um and talk i i'd love to chat about like without you going through stuff you've probably talked about and maybe felt, you know, pressured about like leaving the BBC. And I'm not sure how you felt after that and what spurred no, you on. It's fine. Honestly, it's fine. I've, I've talked about it ad nauseum, but um, so if there's, any, if there is anyone watching this, who's followed me before they've heard it before, but no, you can ask anything. I don't mind. It's just in terms of your mindset when, when you were sacked by the BBC, were you kind of in a, in a, okay, I've got a opportunity to change my kind of career or direction at the moment. And, was writing that you on your mind at that point or because you mentioned obviously you've been on big brother and, and different tv shows i've seen you on did you go was that a direction that you had in mind were you thinking right, i'm gonna i'm gonna just get on different shows or when did writing take off in more of a career sense well i i ought to just first explain to anyone who doesn't know um i was sacked because as a the first openly gay television newsreader in Northern Ireland, I took issue with the BBC nominating the boxer Tyson Fury for an award when he had made homophobic and misogynistic uh, remarks. And yeah. I just said on my own personal Facebook, because I had a lot of uh, gay people, many of whom elderly actually in, in the closet in Northern Ireland, which is a different place, different society, um, who had for a long time been quietly sending me messages saying it means a lot to me. I never thought in my lifetime I'd see an openly gay guy reading the news. It was kind of a big deal. Um, and I just put on my personal Facebook, I don't agree with this. I did mm. say I was ashamed and I was ashamed. I felt really ashamed of, of my employer for doing that. I felt it was weasley and cowardly. Um, and that's where I got sacked. So just in case anyone's imagining I did some kind of terrible thing. <laughs> um, no, I, uh, so when it happened, I suppose I was just confused. I was confused, very emotional, very frightened. I didn't, and, and shocked, I suppose. I didn't really know, and depressed, you know, I put, I was on antidepressants and uh, drink um, and drugs, which I've talked openly about as well. Drugs played a part too. And I was struggling, you know, having a nervous breakdown, I think, really looking back. And um, so I didn't really have a plan. Uh, no news organization would touch me. I did try. I reached out to Channel 4 and Sky and Channel 5 News and various other things and said, I'm qualified. I've won an award. I'm, you know, I'm good at what I do. And I, I don't think I've done anything evil. Yeah. Um, and they all made very polite excuses as to why they wouldn't want me, because, of course, they don't want someone who speaks out. That's the last thing they want is someone who tells the truth as a journalist. Heaven forfend. Um, I don't mean to feed any conspiracy theories. I was never under pressure to misrepresent the fact, but at the same time, any organization, any business doesn't want troublemakers. And I think I was marked as a troublemaker. So no, I, and then and then Endemol called me up as they do. I mean, you know, uh, saying, hi, it's uh, Josh or whatever from Endemol. Uh, we'd like to send someone over to have a coffee with you. And they did. Uh, someone flew to Belfast and um, 
I had an inkling what it would be for and and you know uh, had this conversation for an hour and they were being very shady and very kind of like you know cards to their chest and um in the end it was me I said are you talking about big brother and before I knew it they they basically secretly cast me for big brother which was kind of not the celebrity one it was halfway in between celebrity and uh uh whatever civilian um yeah. and so then I had to pretend to go through a a a process of um uh, you know, I said before this, I get word blindness. Uh, auditioning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had to. I had to go through a process of auditioning, even though they'd already cast me. It was insane. Mm. Um, so anyway, it, it just started. What was the, the being a journalist was already really strange. A strange life to lead. You're you're in the middle of people's normally worst moments, occasionally nice moments, but normally you're in the middle of people's worst moments in their lives, and you're there. It's a very strange existence and you have to be really hard and tough. And I don't think I was hard and tough enough. I'm a very emotional person. It really affected me. Um, uh, and then I found myself in Big Brother and, and uh, for eight weeks, yeah, mm. locked inside that house. But what an amazing way to road test your own personality, being filmed 24 hours a day. Um, I regressed to being a bullied uh, primary school boy um, within about a week. It was t terrifying how quickly I closed into my shell and started doubting myself and feeling picked on and unwelcome, like extraordinary how quickly that happened. Um, and then left after eight weeks to, you know, heartbreak and homelessness and penny and being mm -hmm. kind of having no income. While at the same time, people are walking past you on the street going, oh, it's you. Oh, hello. What's your television? Oh, you must be rolling in it now because I saw you on telly. And I'm like, I am genuinely homeless and I have no job. Yeah. It's been a real roller coaster for you, hasn't it? And it must be must be a nice feeling at the moment to to have started on your writing journey and then receiving praise and i've got a lovely little video because at the st that off your instagram hijacked it um because at the start i mentioned how you know your debut had won um the spirit engineer uh won the historical writers association debut crown award um but also you wrote what was the wild wit competition for the Oscar, oh yes, I see where we are now. Yes, the yeah, Oscar yeah. Wilde Society. Yes, <laughs> yeah. So you, you won a little award for that, and and there's a great video on your Instagram. If it's all right, I'm going to play that here um, with Stephen Fry, and he he's also commented about your new book coming out, which he, he's really a big fan of. And this video is just absolutely mind blowing for an author to to get that kind of um, what's again word blind. I'm getting it. Endorsement. Off. Endorsement. Yes, correct. If thing. it weren't for nihilism, I'd have nothing to live for. Congratulations, A.J. West. That's really very good. And like the best true Wildian epigrams, it um, it requires a little more thought than might at first appear necessary. Hasn't he got a wonderful voice? Oh, don't get me started. I did, after that, I did uh, contact his management um, to just see if one day he might be willing to uh, read my audiobook narrate an audiobook i mean yeah i was very lucky at and you know i hate that phrase i i keep banning myself from saying that phrase i wasn't very lucky i worked really in hard and then ended up having an opportunity off the base of that work i was um i i produced a documentary for uh radio two on um the second world war i interviewed a veteran uh called victor gregg and i wrote the script and i managed to get the late great john hurt um, which I think, uh, if you haven't heard his voice before, you will know it. He has the most extraordinary voice. And he um, narrated the documentary, and I got to script and direct John Hurt, one of my greatest claims to fame. If I could add Stephen Fry to that, yeah, I, re I genuinely, on, I don't know if I could top it. I don't know if I could top it. I, I, it would be, yeah, huge. So uh, Halo mentioned as well uh, a beautiful, powerful story. I mean, it is like I mentioned, it's a roller coaster. So to come out the other side of that and and to to write and have recognition and uh, acclaim uh, from someone like Stephen Fry as well, is that reestablished your confidence in your abilities? Because you mentioned off the back of the BBC, you kind of felt like maybe that you didn't know where your direction was going in, in, in Big Brother, you'd gone back into your shell. So coming out of that other side, has this kind of given you a good purpose now and you feel like you found your home in terms of writing? Oh my God, yes, yeah. Um, I was always meant to be an author, always meant to be an author. And what 
terrifies me. John Hurt is a legend, Anna Bloom, you're right. Um, what always terrifies me is how how easily I could not have been published and how yeah. different how different my life would be now if that had been the case. I don't know. What I realize is I was looking and looking, looking for something to take pride in. I'm a gay man. It's not easy for me to have kids. I would love to be a dad. I, I, I probably won't ever get to be, you know, I like being an uncle. I probably won't ever be a dad. Um, it's just not feasible. Um, but I have, I have so much passion and love to give to something. <laughs> and I realized that part of the reason I was, I struggled so much in my twenties and thirties was because I wasn't, I didn't have that focus. Yeah. I was trying to find it in journalism, but journalism frightened me, terrified me on a daily basis. It was an abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it was, you know, not good for me. Um, yeah. Just not well designed for it, but being an author, for me, you know, to hold this in my hands, you know, you were saying earlier about it's terrifying that even when you're a hugely established author, you're still having to fight. It is, however, you carry on doing it because holding this in my hands, this thing that I've worked on for two years of my life and this, I'll get emotional now when I talk about it. It means more to me than I can possibly put into words. It's, yeah. it's not just something I wrote. It's not a lockdown project. Mm -hmm. It's not, oh, I do it because I didn't really have much else to do and the kids have left school. You know, it's, it's my fucking life. It's yeah. my heart. I've written my life, my heart, my soul into these pages. And so, yeah, am I happy and at home being an author? Absolutely. I would be nothing if I wasn't. And that is terrifying because this book, no one wanted to publish this book. No agent wanted to represent me for this book. Not one agent, not one even asked to read the book when I when I was trying to get an agent. I got published without an agent and it was my last ditch attempt with a publisher without an agent that published this best-selling award-winning novel. Wow. And after that, the success of that book, someone asked me the other day, well, it must've been easy to get published after you had success with your first. No, it wasn't. It was an absolute <laughs> nightmare. I got rejected. I got rejected. I now have one of the best agents in the country, David Headley at DHH. I'm a bestseller. I won an award. I have spent two years writing and researching an original, what I think happens to be a beautiful story. And every single mainstream publisher, big publisher, turned this down without even a qualm. Like, not even a breath, not a blink. No, thanks. It's like, oh my God. It's like being kicked in the face on a constant basis sometimes. And, um, Thank God, thank God for publishers like Duckworth, although they turned down Thomas True anyway, but whatever. Thank God for <laughs> Duckworth for, for publishing my first novel and Arenda Books, Karen mm -hmm. Sullivan and the team at Arenda Books, who, who champion authors who want to tell different, unusual, original stories. Yes. Because if it were not for independent publishers, you saw how emotional I got talking about my books then. If it were not for independent publishers, I wouldn't, I just don't know what, I don't know where I don't, to be completely honest, I don't know where I'd be here. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is what frightens me when we look at the world of publishing now and the way that the big publishers are working and how people are getting published and the choices that are being made by sales teams rather than editors yeah. increasingly. It's really scary. Sorry, I hope, sorry if that's too intense for a Friday night. Not at all. Absolutely not. Because it's it's the real journey of, of people. And that's what this show is all about, is is the author and their journey. And I think you, you've you spoken from the heart. And that's what we need to hear. Um, because it is tough. And the fact that you are holding those books is a massive achievement. And what I'll do is I'll play the next video for part two. And we'll get to talk about the portrayals of Thomas Drew and that two-year process. Because... Um, a lot of people write different speeds <clears throat> and with historical fiction, I'm discovering as a panster, I now have to definitely be a big plotter. Um, so yeah, tough journey in the historical fiction. So watch the story coming right up.
Yes. So, AJ, uh, the betrayal of Thomas True, as you were holding in your hand there, which which looks fantastic and has, as I mentioned, praise from that video earlier. Not in that video, but Stephen Fry has also praised this book, along with Catriona uh, Ward, who's been on the show before, um, and lots of other people leaving great comments about that before it's even out. Um, interestingly, it's coming out on July 4th. Any yes. reasons for that date? Um, no, it was going to be coming out in June 6th, I think it was. Um, and then for uh, bookseller reasons, uh, to give it a little bit more time, um, really good reason, actually. The, the sales team were just getting such good feedback and were so excited about it. They were like, if we could have another four weeks just to get our ducks in a row, it'd be great. So it was mm. pushed back then to July the 4th. I think publishers, I think clever publishers, they do try and get a sense of what books are coming out when, what time of year, who are the big sellers, when are they launching? I mean, my book comes out the same uh, day as the new Lisa Jewell. So there's no chance of me being a number one bestseller um, <laughs> with this one. I mean, ha the audacity of me to even think I was in for the running for that is insane. But it's isn't it fascinating? Do you watch the number, the sales numbers on the Sunday Times bestseller list? I don't know. Oh, my God. It's it is fascinating. So like one week you can sell three and a half thousand copies and you're Sunday Times number one bestseller. Then the next week you have to sell 15,000 copies. Yeah. Like it just it is. There's an element of the luck of the draw timing. Um, apparently around July time is when a lot of the uh, fantasy TikTok book boxes are released now. Mm. So it used to be quite a fallow period. So if you're a smaller publisher with a less well-known author, you could put your book out around July. The summer holiday books have already been released by the big celebrities. They've yeah. had their day um, and you'd have a chance, you know, at getting good ranking now because of the TikTok fantasy bam off that it is um that, that there i don't think there is a time of the year now where you can release and, and get a quiet period so it's quite daunting actually yeah it's quite daunting mm. but i don't know why exactly they chose that week okay so what i'd like you to do if you can either if if you haven't got a pitch for this book you can read the blurb but could you pitch the betrayal of thomas true to the audience so they can know what this story is all about please Yes. So in early 1700s London, you had this underground secret culture called the Molly Houses and Molly Markets. And in modern parlance, you're talking there about queer spaces. You're talking about gay bars. You're talking about gay hookup spots. Um, and these were coffee houses um, and they were parks and the old London Bridge, uh, the exchange. Um, and you had working men were going to these uh, molly houses to cavort, to give it a polite term, but also to socialize, to make friends and, and to explore who they really were. Um, it's based on a true story of uh, the raid of Mother Clapp's Molly House, which is the most famous Molly House in history, which is documented in the Old Bailey archives. Why is it documented in the Old Bailey archives? Unfortunately, it's because they raided Mother Clapp's Molly House, they arrested 40 men, and three of those men were hanged, um, in spite of the fact that they weren't actually caught doing anything more than having their breaches undone. And in spite of the fact that people came and testified to say, this guy's never made a move on me. He's my mm -hmm. mate. Uh, I've never seen this guy behave in a sodomitical way. Not that by our standards, there should be anything wrong with that. But in those days, it was illegal. And, and by the way, he's a good guy, Gabriel Lawrence. He's a good guy and uh, a single father. Uh, to, and you're going to turn a little girl into an orphan as much as anything else. And the jury were like, no, it's OK, we'll hang him. Um, wow. I heard this. I discovered this story when I was listening to Tales from the Old Bailey, which is a series on Radio 4. And as soon as I heard it, I thought, I need to write a story about this one day. Mm. So it's always been a, a novel I wanted to write. In my book, this is a very long elevator. This is like Burj Khalifa elevator pitch. Um, in my book, you have Gabriel Griffin and uh, Thomas True. And they have to try and unmask a traitor amongst them who is giving their names away to a pair of murderous justices. And they've got to catch the rat before they get hanged. And it's mm. complicated by one slight problem, uh, which is that even though they're very shy and naive, they're falling in love. Yeah. 
it's, it's amazing, isn't it? The stories you can find in history. And this is why I, I was very excited to chat to you today to do with the historical fiction the journey that I'm currently on. But I've always talked about how people can literally look around in their very local area. Even if you live in the country somewhere, you will find something inspiring and amazing that you can write about. So in London, there must be so many decades worth of stories and different eras and personal stories that you can use. So what was it specifically about the characters in this that you really liked? And how did you then weave in? What, what I like to know with historical fiction is where do you draw the line between actual fiction and the fantasy element or the, the fictional element? The fictional element. Um, sorry, I just lost you for a second there. Yeah. Um, where do you draw the line? I, I don't... Um, I don't think you need to. I think it's wherever you want the line to be. Can you hear me, by the way? Yeah, yeah. You can. Good. Sorry, it just it flashed, and I thought I could lost you. Um, I don't. It's where you, where do you want the line to be? It's up to mm. you. You're writing fiction, and people forget this. It's like I could write a story about. I mean, there's been a whole hoo ha, hasn't there, about uh, blind casting and racial diversity and and Anne Boleyn. Should you have a, a black woman playing Anne Boleyn? Those kind of stuff. I think. As long as someone is doing something creatively for a reason, because it's the way they want to tell the story and they're not doing it because they want to look good, right? Yeah. I, then I have no issue with it. I have an issue with smugness and insincerity generally in life. Um, I mean, you know, even if, you want, if, even if someone wants to do something insincerely and smugly, then there's no reason why you can't. If you're writing fiction, you're writing fiction, you're writing fiction. Um, I can't remember what she wrote, but Rebecca F. Quang wrote in the foreword to Babel something that put very succinctly the fact that, listen, if you're a pedant and you know more than I do on this subject, then I'm just the author and deal with it. You know, and I think I think that's the, that's the truth. When you're dealing with the, the complication with um, the spirit engineer was that actually there were people alive today who still remember yeah. the people in this book. Now, that's different because then I think you're dealing with people's lived reality and i do want to be cautious of their um feelings mm -hmm. however with the betrayal of thomas true we're talking about the early 1700s everyone is long dead um and the men i'm writing about uh died far too young at, at tyburn so I, I gave myself freedom. I changed names to give myself freedom so gabriel lawrence became gabriel griffin thomas wright became thomas true um uh, there was uh, another guy called uh, William Griffin. So, you know, the characters in my novel loosely represent the people from, yeah. from history. But the most important thing, right, I read a lot of historical fiction. Do not, do not be fooled into thinking accuracy is more important than narrative. Mm. You are there to tell a story. Now, Hilary Mantel some people love Hilary Mantel, some people can't get on with it. She was so brilliant at staying so true to fact, but doing it, I think, in a brilliant way and, and creating tension and drama and inventing dialogue that felt totally authentic. Uh, someone like Philippa Gregory or Alison Weir, for instance, will maybe play a little bit faster and looser with certain fact and will, you know, fictionalise more. But my God, do they tell a brilliant story. And they're both valid. It's amazing, isn't it? Um yeah, it, was there anything, obviously you mentioned that it took you like two years to write this story and I imagine the process would be a lot of fact and, and working on the, that you know special dialogue, but was there anything that you discovered while researching for this story that really surprised you? Yes, although it's slightly, I worry about, I, I need to practice how I'm gonna answer this question because <laughs> there is, there is, what really surprised me was the behavior of women towards gay men. Okay. That we are used to hearing stories of, you know, the patriarchy and toxic, toxic masculinity and, you know, men are the oppressors and, you know, and undoubtedly in the 1700s, men ruled and, uh, you know, guilty of huge cruelty. Um, I was talking to the um, non-fiction uh, historical author, Hallie Rubenhold, who wrote um, The Five, which um, uh, has inspired lots of dramas. And she, she wrote books that inspired Harlots and, you know, very highly respected kind of feminist uh, non-fiction author. I was really nervous about talking to her about this. And she said, no, you're absolutely right. That, you know, women Harlots 
hated molly culture mm. and women generally in society were hateful towards mollies that there's an account that i read where they had to keep the constables kept the men back in a pillorying um in the stocks but they allowed the women to go forward and that was quite standard in pillorying so the men would be kept back by the constables as a ring around the pillory and the person would be locked in with their head in their hands and the women were left to do their thing and my god did those women love violence like throwing rocks dead cats piss shit broken glass anything they could lay their hands on they didn't care if that person died particularly if they're a sodomite there are very few small things where they were very happy if you died in the stocks you know if you just stolen a pheasant or something you'd probably be okay but they would have to use a stick to wipe and clean out the nose and mouth because their face was so caked in in, in detritus they, they were choking in the stocks and they were bloody back to the skull and they had their jaws broken and their eyes broken what really surprised me about this was the violence of the mob mentality but the role that women played in that mm. and what hallie Rub rubenhold said to me was really interesting she was like we're talking here about people who themselves are victims of violence sexual violence and violence at home and also you know in a violent life generally they're desensitized and yeah um they're angry and you know quite rightly so and then and they take it out on someone who seems to be even who has even less agency than themselves and the other thing that i didn't realize uh, that also helps explain it is that homosexuality in men in the 1700s was perceived as a hatred of women it was it was not a love of men or an attraction to men it was mm. this man hates women so much he would rather have intercourse with a man than with a woman. Um, Daniel Defoe writes about it in such terms. Um, the, the, the poisonous, toxic way that homosexuality was talked about then was such that you really were no better than an animal. In fact, you were yeah. in some cases worse. So, so that was very frightening to read, but fascinating too. Mm -hmm. And to try and reflect that in the book that doesn't seem as though I'm damning or criticizing women or any of these groups, you, you know, because they were all oppressed and, and um, uh, beasted really by, by their own lives and by society. That was a real challenge. Yeah, it sounds it. I mean, to be able to, uh, to add all these elements into your book and you know, have a, a true kind of storyline without being distracted by one of the bigger themes. Was that a tricky thing? Because in my mind, if I was in that situation, I'd be writing very heavily about this kind of theme that's going on, but then be missing out on some other parts. Is that Was that an issue for you, or were you quite well prepared in the plot with this? I, I cover some really big themes in the book. I talk about the way... Um, uh, the way that the queer uh, community treat each other, um, mm. uh, the way they're treated by society, um, homophobia, but misogyny as well, and the way lesbians are, you know, presented in the queer world. So uh, it's filled with my thoughts on my life and, and the world we live in right now. I think as a writer, if you are following a story and you're living through your characters, big themes come through whether you want it or not. And if you are the only way the big themes aren't going to come through is is if your characters are small and your story is small just just try and tell the most exciting story you can and you'll find that your 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 book starts telling you what it's about and trust nice. it yeah i like that yeah big shout out to um halo scott in the chat and anya pavel there's a lot of the guys that kind of tune into the show are um the founders of queerindie.com so if you're interested in a queer literacy literary literacy and analyze of that as well check that out queerindie.com very good website for you to look at um okay so uh i want to move on to the final part of the show because we're pushing on time it's always a good sign of a good show where um we always run late so if you've got questions for aj now is the time to send them in please and we can get to asking him some questions while you're doing that i'll play the last little video then I will ask him some random questions from the show and then get onto yours. So coming up, community questions. You are 
are very welcome, Halo. Uh, okay, so um, community questions. AJ, I know you've been preparing for these questions uh, slightly. If you could take a character from the world of fiction, either out for the day or put into one of your novels, what character from the world of fiction would you take and why? Um, I think it would have to be Toad from Toad Hall in uh, Wind in the Willows. It's my favourite book when I was a little boy. I was just absolutely spellbound by the whole thing and I still love it now. Um, and he just used to make me giggle and laugh. And what I loved about what I loved about Toad, I didn't realise at the time, is that he's a complete unapologetic camp outcast. I had no idea. He's so camp. He's so wonderfully flamboyant and just lives his best life. And mm. so I just love to see what else he would get up to. <laughs> love that answer. Um, brilliant. OK. If you could change the ending to anything, uh, and that can be a TV show, a movie, or a book, what ending will you change your life? Um, well, the book that had the biggest impact on me in my life, the first book really that made me drop the book and gasp was uh, Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy. If anyone's read it, there's about three quarters of the way through, there's something that happens that I just couldn't believe had happened, and I still can't to this day. Um, and I just want to reach inside that book and, and give that guy a hug um he was quite inspirational to me writing thomas true actually as a character and also the book thomas true as a character learns quite a lot from jude jude uh, in jude the obscure so i would like to i'd like to give him i don't want to do any spoilers but i'd like to well i quite fancy him actually so i'd like to give him a kiss but um <laughs> no i'd like to i'd like to kind of take him out for some sandwiches and cheer him up a bit take him out for some sandwiches lovely what what, <laughs> what would be your sandwich of choice I would, I tell you what, if you ever go to Hay on Wye, there's a little cafe there, an old 1920s cafe just down at the bottom of the little hill, and they do the most amazing tuna melts with pesto. Mm. I can't even begin to describe how delicious they are. I would love to go to Hay on Wye one day. It's definitely on my list. You know, um, never been. Oh, you are. Oh, the cinema bookshop, Gay on Wye's just opened, Clock Tower Books, and lovely cafes. It's wonderful. You must go. Yeah, it's uh, we, we're going to Harrogate again for the third time this year, um, working with Pam McMillan. But uh, Helm Y is definitely one we need to put on the list and get to that somehow. But, I've yeah. never been to Harrogate. Oh, it's so much fun! I can't afford it. it. Oh, it is expensive. It is. You need to tell fun. them, you need to tell them there's this really good guy, put him on a panel, and then I can afford it. I just yeah. can't. Much as I'd love to stand in that marquee drinking wine, I not yet. Well, last year as well was extra special because uh, Richard Osman put on Twitter a secret phrase you could tell the bar staff to get free drinks. Oh. Uh, so we got access to that very quickly. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you, uh, yeah, okay. Um, I'll, I'll move on after this question because there are some coming in, so I do need to ask them. If you are looking back at your life on your deathbed, as we spoke about, um, and kind of overseeing what you've done in your life and your career, what would success look like to you? Well, I will never die, so uh, I will never have. Uh, I, I, I'm absolutely terrified of death. Um, what would success look like for me? I suppose the answer that everyone gives is, I suppose, just I want to be happy and healthy. I just want to be grateful. I just feel really lucky. I was in the right place at the right time. I'm not going to say that. I uh, success would look like for me. I live in a castle. Uh, I fly. I fly in a helicopter regularly. I am number one billing at all the festivals, Hay and Harrogate and all of them. And in fact, I just say no, because I'm just too busy and I can't be bothered. And um, I have a pile of books so big at the front of every bookshop that no one can get in. Nice. That's the most imaginative uh, answer we've ever had for that question. I really like And that. it will happen. Yeah. It will definitely happen. Just all people need to do is pre-order. <laughs> Yeah, the betrayal of Thomas True. Um, what I'll do is, uh, I normally do this, I haven't yet, but it will be there after this show. The link for that pre-order will be in the description. Um, and before we move on to the final few questions, we may as well tell it now. Where can people pick that up or order that from? Okay. AJ West, AJ West author dot, uh, no, AJ, at AJ West author on uh, uh, Twitter and everything. Uh, Instagram is my happy place and um, there's a link tree there and you can go on that and that has Bert's books who I absolutely adore, West End Lane books, Bookish Crick How, um, there's a list there and, and Goldsboro books if you're a subscriber as well are going to have their own special version 
um, of, of it with a different sprayed edge. It's going to have peacock sprayed edges, peacock feathers. I'm going to the factory to see them print it, which is going to be like a dream come true. Um, that, but really important. Cool. It's also if you if you like if you like ordering from Waterstones, that's also really cool because the more pre-orders they get, the more confident they are that they can actually order some in and make a bit of a fuss about it, which is huge. So. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, sprayed edges. Uh, the factory. It'd be great to see that happen. Um, You're not allowed to film it because they're really secretive uh, about how it happens. Apparently, even though uh, we all know, I think yeah. we all know, right? Mm, well, we'll see. Uh, um, and yeah, thank you for your question. If you had to choose to write historical fiction set on another continent, where would you go? Nice question. Oh, that's such a oh gosh, that's such a good question. And um, well, my third book possibly is going to be set on the African continent. Um, nice. A long capital L, lots of O's time ago. Um, <laughs> so yeah, really stretch myself, but I think it's going to be set on the African continent. So that's, that's what it would be. I would struggle with, I would struggle with a lot of people um, I know who are authors, they like writing in Venice or Rome or, you know, Paris. And I just could never, I could never, I just don't, I, I can't speak the language. I, I went to comprehensive school. Apparently I was taught to speak German. I have nicht idea. Um, I just couldn't. Whereas I feel as though actually uh, to explain the African continent, I'm talking like millennia ago. So beyond any modern understanding of society, that feels to me like something very interesting that I can look at proto languages and proto um, society and things. Um, I've given away too much. But there we are. Yeah. Well, I mean, the only reason they kind of like to go to Venice in those places is probably just go to, to go for a research holiday. I'm sure. Well, you said it. <laughs> mm. uh, okay. Thank you, Anya. That's a great question. Halo says, "What are your top three tips? Uh, life tips? Life tips. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very good question. Um, uh." don't worry too much about monogamy uh, as long as you're respectful to your partner and you're honest um uh, remember that everyone else you know particularly the confident people uh are wildly unhappy and insecure uh, in various ways and the best thing you can do for them is to tell them how wonderful they are um because then they might just do it for you. And then if they don't, well, who loses? Um, and I'd say the third thing is uh, drink Guinness instead of lager because it's actually lower calorie and lower alcohol percentage. So you wake up the next morning feeling healthier and less hungover and really satisfied. Nice. I love that tip. Um, have you ever been to the Guinness uh, factory? As you mentioned, you were in Ireland before. Yes, I have. Mm. Absolutely. I can't remember it because I got absolutely. <laughs> it's still on my bucket list. I can't wait for one day going there. Um, Halo's got one more. Uh, thank you. What books, movies and or TV shows do you draw the most writing inspiration from? Well, um, I was hugely inspired by Moulin Rouge when I read, uh, when I watched that, uh, when that first came out. I, it's the only film I've ever seen more than once. Um, I've never seen any films more than once apart from Moulin Rouge. I went back to see that six times at the cinema and I've watched it many times since. I think wow. for me, it's the, it's the most perfect film I've ever seen in my life and I'm yet to see anything in it I don't like. Um, it's endlessly wonderful. And that did impact uh, the writing of The Spirit Engineer because um the the uh the mechanism of opening with the ending i remember when i first watched that film i'd never seen that before now mm. it's slightly more common with netflix and streaming services but it was really new to me the idea that you'd open with the ending and i remember sitting there watching and thinking oh my god why yes moulin rouge halo scott high five um like why why am i going to watch the rest of this film i know how it ends yeah. and and then it just was a revelation to me that i was even more drawn into this story because i needed to know how do we get there mm. the tragedy the sense of tragedy and i think it's because people often say why do people love twists and why do people love this certain type of structure 
it's because it speaks to our own experience in life. Life is twists, right? Life is reveals and twists. The friend you thought was your friend actually has been slagging you off and sleeping with your boyfriend. Twist. The boss you thought had given you a job because they thought you were good at it actually just, you know, is rubbish at their job and just wanted someone to, I don't know, organize the paper clips. Reveal. You know, life is full of disappointing, surprising, exciting, wonderful, joyful twists. The person you thought was your best friend at school actually turns out to be your husband, right? The, the kid the kid that you thought was going to be like a mathematician because you love maths turns out to be, you know, just only interested in sculpture. Life is unknown and books give us unknown. They give us twists and reveals over and over and over again. And so does life. And I think that's why we love it. And why does that particular structure with Moulin Rouge and the spirit engineer work? It's the same. We are all thinking, I, I'm pretty sure I know how this is going to end. Mm -hmm. I just don't know how I'm going to get there. I love it. Amazing answer and great question. Thank you. Uh, two more for you. I know we're keeping you behind the. No, no, there's enough time slightly. in the world. My husband, my husband is currently in a gay bar getting drunk. So, uh... <laughs> well, in two more questions, you can go join him. So there you go. Um, David Gillen, thank you for your question. Have you got to the stage where you can enjoy writing as a reader rather than the writer? I hope that makes sense. It really does. Yeah your writing as a reader so enjoying my own writing as a reader rather than as a writer um well i mean other people's writing um it's a little bit like working in a, a restaurant or being a you know chef i suppose and you're eating other people's food you can't switch off the bit where you're thinking would i have done that or oh my god i yeah. could never write that i was reading anna matzler's book recently and i can't remember what she wrote but she wrote something and William Golding, Nobel Prize winning author. And I read other authors and I think I could never write that. I could mm. never come up with that. But I have my own things that I come up with. Um, so no, I can't, I, can't, I actually, I suppose the truth, truthful answer is no, I can't. I, you know, since becoming a published novelist, I can't read um, books um, in the way I did before or, or enjoy them in the way I did before. The critical, self-critical thing is, is too strong. Yeah. How, how quickly do you uh, read a book? Oh my god, I'm the slowest reader in the world. Yeah, me too. I hate, I just, I do you know what? I love, I love reading, but I, anyone who reads my books will know my chapters are like two pages long <laughs> because that's how my brain works. Apparently, I'm ADHD, I haven't got the energy to get diagnosed, god knows, but I have not got the staying power. When I see that like a chapter is 30 pages long or something, I'm like, no, queen, I'm out. I'm, I'm that's it, I'm done. I need like a month holiday to do that. Um, I like I like to feel as though there's a point where I can start and end before I put the book down. I cannot yeah. stop halfway through a chapter. So that becomes a problem, right? Um, so I'm a very slow reader because I do like to ponder what I'm reading. Um, mm. And I, I'm suspicious of people who say, you know, on TikTok, I wrote, I read 60 books this month. I'm yeah. like, ha I don't get, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't, it's impossible I had, right i had one person say i'm doing a challenge on tiktok and i'm going to read the spirit engineer uh in uh an afternoon like half a day and i actually messaged them back and i said i'd rather you didn't because you're not going i i spent three years of my life writing that and i would really love it it's a bit like going to like a, a, a restaurant where the chef really cares and just putting everything in a blender and drinking it you know yeah. Like I specifically tried my best to give you a special reading experience. Um, and I like I like people to take their time with it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, thank you for your question, David. And we've got one more from Lee Edwards. Thank you very much. Uh, did you have a soundtrack whilst you were writing for Thomas True? I did, Lee. Yes, I did. And you can find it on Spotify. Um, yes. Uh, it's on my link tree, actually. There's two. There's one uh, when I walked to the library. There's one I'd listen to when I was going to write emotional uh, scenes. And there was one I'd listen to when I wanted to write fun, joyous scenes. They're both um, filled with um, queer artists and allies. And it's just filled with um, beautiful, uh, moving and fun music. And so I did. Yeah. You can find that on Spotify. It's called, there's one that's called... Um, Mother Claps Molly House and the other one is called I Know What Love Is. Mother Claps Molly House and I Know What Love Is. I think if you search on uh, Spotify, that will come up. Uh, do you listen to music that's got lyrics in? Because um, I used to, but now I don't. I'm more I, I, instrumental now. 
I, I listen to um, I listen to classical music sometimes when I'm writing, but only if I need to block out someone who's annoying near me. Um, <laughs> generally, I like to write in silence, but I have, again, back to the ADHD supposed thing, but I have misophonia is, is yeah. a symptom, right, where I just, I, honestly, the sound of someone's tongue or crunching a bottle or even tapping their foot or something, I just, it honestly makes me want to go out on some sort of murderous rampage. So I often have to listen to some um, classical music uh, for yeah. that. Um, well, I The music I listen to that I just mentioned is when I'm walking to the library mm -hmm. or I'm walking home from the library. And it just fills me with this emotion that then I can put onto the page. Yeah. So the library is your writing space then? The library is my writing space and so no ASMR for me, honestly, I can't, I just, I have no <laughs> idea how, it, for me, like forget water torture, forget thumb screws. If you just played a video to me of someone eating with a microphone close to their mouth, I would tell you all the information you want to know. I'd be the worst spy. You would just basically eat with your mouth open and I'd be like, here are all the names. <laughs> like, just <laughs> please close your mouth. Yeah. I, I, honestly, it's and actually it's a real problem. Like if you're sitting in a library, it is extraordinary to me how inconsiderate people are with noise in libraries yeah. these I mean, days. Is eating in a library like a normal thing? Because I don't remember. Well, they're not that. allowed to eat. I'm a mm. shusher and I'm a I grass people up. I mean, honestly, <laughs> I'm like I'm I'm just covered in grass stains by the time I leave the London Library. But I do. I go down and I say that person's drinking. Well, this guy drinking a can of beer one day. That because of that, they're eating a sandwich. They're they're watching Netflix. This person keeps gulping, and they they do have to say to me, AJ, you need to just okay. The gulping we can do nothing about. That's <laughs> that's just like being alive. Um, and then, of course, the hilarious thing is that, you know, quite often I'm walking through the library and I trip over and I knock over a chair or I make some massive noise. And I, I realise what an idiot I am and how much of a hypocrite I am. But when you're there, there are some scenes when people read Thomas True, some really, really emotive, intense scenes. And just know that at the most piquant moment of those intense scenes, I guarantee you someone burped or did some <laughs> horrible snorty noise up of because they had a cold. It was incredible to me. Every time I was about to write possibly the most important lines of Thomas True, someone would do something extraordinarily annoying. That's amazing to think of. I honestly yeah. like when you're reading the saddest or the most intense moments in this book, know that know that the author was raging. <laughs> <laughs> amazing well that book is being called where is it uh the portrayal of thomas true this year's most devastating unforgettable historical thriller it sounds absolutely incredible and as uh, aj mentioned you can pre-order that book and the links we will put everywhere everywhere and if you're following him on wherever go on there and find that link tree uh link and pick that book up um and we will support you through that launch as well aj but all i can say thank you so much for coming on the show and joining us and telling us your story because it's been fantastic it's been open it's been honest and you know you've put some brilliant tips in there and some funny stories as well so thank you so much for me um it's been wonderful no, thank you very much and for anyone who is watching this now or watching this in the future i would just like to say um don't worry if you are not from the right background or you don't feel as though you're being welcomed into the publishing industry do fight do make contacts with people. Don't be shy or afraid of reaching out. Um, you deserve to be published. And one way or another, you will be. Amazing. Brilliant. Everybody, have a fantastic weekend. Look after yourselves. Stay safe. Get some good writing done or some reading. Relax. Work hard. Up to you. Uh, have fun. And we will see you next week for another show. Um, and, yeah, thank you so much. And from us, it's goodbye. See you all soon. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.